This is a really good sound. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah, great. With the popular history book that came out a few years ago about the General Slocum disaster, along with the addition of the building that had been St. Mark's Evangelical Lutheran Church in, to the Greenwich Village Historic District in 2010, there's been a recent resurgence of memory about the event. For those of you who do not know about the tragedy, in 1904, about 1,300 members of St. Mark's boarded the General Slocum ferry boat to travel to their annual picnic. But on the way, the ship caught fire off the coast of the Bronx, and over a thousand people on the ship, mostly women and children, died. Until the September 11th attacks, it was the worst disaster in New York City history. And yet, unlike we see today, with the efforts to memorialize 9-11, or with a similar disaster that happened eight years after this on the Titanic, the General Slocum disaster was quickly forgotten and was mostly lost to public memory. <coughs> after giving you a background of the building that, hosts, that housed St. Mark's, and the after effects of the disaster in the form of what the building has become, we will show you the history of memorialization of the event and reasons for the reason for the way it's uh, remembered. So before we actually begin about the history of the building itself, I think we should take a little step back and give ourselves a little bit of contextual and social history. So, um, during, so basically during the mid to late 19th century, we saw a mass influx of German immigration. And by the 1850s, we saw over 800,000 Germans pass through this New York City itself. And by 1855, New York actually had become the, lar the third largest German population next to Berlin and Vienna. And because of this, it was actually named Hundertland, uh, Little German. And to give you a sense of how small or actually really big the Little Germany actually was, it comprised of the current day East Village, Alphabet City, parts of Chinatown, the Bowery, Little Italy, and Malia. So just to conceptualize that, that's from 14th Street all the way down to Division Street, and from the East River all the way to the Bowery. And so here's just an example of um, St. Mark's, uh, yeah, St. Mark's and Second Avenue back in the 1870s. So between all of that, we see Tompkins Square as one of the main hubs of centralization. So that's where draft riots took place, where labor riots took place. It's also where a lot of ethnic cohesion took place and a lot of where gatherings were. So when I talk about ethnic cohesion, we see that because it's such a large community, there are also many little more smaller communities. So they were called societies. And you were, you were expected to join a society, but not because of your occupation or because of anything in particular. You joined it for social fun, basically. And so these societies can be, uh, for instance, one of the same, if you are the society from the same village, the same town in Ger back in Germany in the home country, or a same club, or an occupation, or a secret society. <coughs> basically, the bottom line of the societies was to have fun. They were social clubs, basically. And the bottom line was to dance and drink, and that was the main purpose of it all. And so, in the instance, you basically have drinking establishments all over the place. One street can be 14 blocks long, for instance, and there are only 65, and there are 65 places to drink. Not only 65, there are 65 places where you can drink and purchase alcohol. So, but one of the things that we do see, however, is between 1870 and 1900, even before the General Slocum incident, we see that the second generation German Americans begin to move away. And they're moving away from this huge Klein Deutschland, um, all the way over to Brooklyn, uh, specifically Williamsburg, and then up to the Upper East Side, particularly Yorkville. And so what we see here is that the neighborhood begins to change as well as new immigration comes <coughs> in and shrinks Klein Deutschland and it becomes a little bit more diverse. So now that we have that in mind, we can actually discuss what the building uh, itself means or, or the, the history of it all. So we step back to 1846 when three lots were purchased by the corporation of the United German Lutheran Church for $6,600 at the time. And in 1847, in the subsequent year, construction began. The one real oddity about this building, actually there are two oddities. Uh, the first being that no one ever knew who the architect was. And the second oddity being the fact that at, the, at this current time, 1847, Gothic Revival and Green Revival were really the main um, aesthetics. However, the architect chose to go with a Renaissance, uh, a Renaissance revival style. So that was quite unusual from, from the time. And so, and so basically, with the initial congregation that was formed, they were formed from the St. Matthew's Church. And they were recognized in 1847 as the Evangelical Lutheran Church of St. Matthew. 
1848, subsequently, sub subsequent year, uh, construction was completed. And basically on June 4th, it was dedicated. And the new St. Mark's Church continued to rent for quite some time. Um, they rented from St. Matthew's Church until 1857, when it was finally purchased for a sum of $8,000. Just to give you some kind of idea, that's currently today $194,000. It's still cheaper than anything we can afford today in the East Village. So, <laughs> congregants of this particular church were skilled laborers and merchants, and that's really important to know, um, especially when we talk later. And the last addition to this particular church before uh, General Slocum was this addition of the study and work. You'll have to forgive my height because the microphone is not tall enough for me. So. <laughs> so between 1904 and 1939, the building remained home to the St. Mark's Church. By the close of the 1930s, St. Mark's membership was approximately 50. At, uh, at this time, those who remained headed north and combined with the Zion Church on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Zion was founded in its current location in 1892 in Yorkville, where there was an expanding German community. St. Mark's officially combined with Zion in 1946, after most of the remaining congregants left the Lower East Side and moved to Yorkville. The merge can still be seen today as that church still exists under the name Zion St. Mark's Evangelical Church, which you can see right over my left shoulder. In 1940, the former St. Mark's Church became associated with the second of New York's significant, significant immigrant communities. The building changed hands and became the community synagogue center, which served Orthodox Jews. The project was financed by businessman Saul Burns, who was well known for building Lower East Side apartment houses and founding member Max Isaacs. The acquisition of 323 East 6th Street cost $27,000 during this transaction. During the early years of the synagogue, the Lower East Side was home to the world's largest Jewish community with regard to density. Most of these people were from Eastern Europe. Something to note in the era that we are, is the era that we are discussing. This was not a first generation community of immigrant Jews. Rather, it was a well-established population of second, third, and even later generations. Predictably, the building underwent a number of structural and design changes after Burns Group purchased it. A makitsa, which is a screen that divides the male and female seating sections, was added to the interior as per Orthodox Jewish custom. And you can actually see the makitsa on this image right here. It's a screen on the right side of uh, the seating. And I'm lucky I can reach it. Yeah, six foot seven. So uh, the building went, underwent additional changes after becoming the community synagogue. The roundels at the balcony level were replaced with Jewish motifs and the names of members of the synagogue. Some of the less symbolic changes include the replacement of staircases, tiling of floors, redesigning some rooms, and installation of fire escapes and exits. And you can actually see a couple of the new stained glass windows that replace the old Christian ones with the star of David on them and the names of the members, founding members beneath them. Between 1982 and 1983, the community synagogue absorbed the Max D. Racing Center, which had previously been known as the East Side Hebrew Institute. The institute was a private school at 295 East 8th Street on Avenue B. The merging of these two places led the 6th Street Synagogue to change its name to the Community Synagogue Max D. Racing Center. The Eastside Hebrew Institute was founded in 1910 by a group of immigrants from Zitomir, Russia. Its first principal and founder was a man named David Zislowski. Max Raskin was appointed the principal of the institute in 1948 when he became a leading figure of the Lower East Side Jewish community. And we have an image here of Max Raskin in the former building that was home to the Eastside Institute, uh, Eastside Hebrew Institute. But things quickly changed in the 1960s and 70s for the Eastside Hebrew Institute, as the area that it was situated in began to be perceived as dangerous. A New York Times article from 1967 describes the local hazards. It quoted Rat, uh, Raskin, who called the Institute racist in an area where Jews had previously made up the majority of the population. 
Grace con continued describing recent bouts of, <coughs> of anti-Semitism in the area, hearing ethnic slurs and witnessing vandalism on his building. This is representative of a time where many Jewish families moved out of the area, now called Alphabet City, as well as other parts of the Lower East Side to different sections of New York City. The East Side Hebrew Institute's student body dwindled as parents chose closer and presumably safer places for their children to get a Jewish education. What makes this building of interest to historians is mainly its connection to the incident we began this presentation with. The thousand lives lost of St. Mark's church members in the tragic accident aboard the General Slocum. Like with the September 11th attacks, there was a central location that tied all of the victims together, and yet there's no museum, no statue, and until 2004, not even a plaque marking the event at the location. So why this lack of memory at the central location of the grief process? Shortly after the event, the survivors of the disaster formed the organization of the General Slocum Survivors. Since this was made up of actual survivors of the incident, by the 1980s, membership was only down to a dozen. The Queen's Historical Society created the Slocum Memorial Committee to continue the annual remembrance ceremony that the previous organization had created. The reason that this fell to the Queen's Historical Society was that the annual ceremony happened at the memorial for the victims who were never found, placed in 1905 in the All Faith Cemetery in, Mid <coughs> in Middle Village, Queens, the cemetery in which most of the victims were buried. Aside from the memorial at that gravesite, there are two other memorial places to the event. A small memorial fountain in Tompkins Square Park, placed there in 1905 by the Sympathy Society of German Ladies, and a plaque in front of St. Mark's, as I previously mentioned, which was placed in 2004 by the Maritime Industry Museum, who that year also organized a voyage of remembrance, in which they led guests on a ship voyage following the fateful path of the General Slocum on that day 100 years before. Before the plaque from 2004, since St. Mark's had changed to a synagogue, there was no remembrance or memorial at the center of grief to honor the victims. Neither the site where the victims lost their lives, nor the site that brought them all together were used to remember them. Even the ship had been salvaged and the public was over that it took over a hundred years after all the survivors had passed away or even a plaque to be placed at St. Mark's is surprising when we compare it to the memorialization of other similar events. This area at St. Mark's had become a place of forgetting rather than remembering. The disaster had caused a speeding up of the process of relocation of the German immigrant community which had already started. The families of the community, of which almost every single one had lost a loved one or close friend, wanted to leave the place behind. Mm -hmm. Outside of the community, the reasons for the loss of remembrance of the event are more complicated. Unlike the sinking of the Titanic just eight years later, this event, which happened in the city and, the, and should therefore be remembered by the city residents, few people in the general population of New York or elsewhere in America even know of the incident. One of the reasons for this is that the sinking of the Titanic affected all economic classes, most importantly the highest economic class. Some of the richest Americans were aboard the Titanic, whereas the deaths on the General Slocum only affected a single working class immigrant community. But even today, when interest in memorializing the event has been renewed in the past decade, the event is still not memorialized in the way that we would assume from such a tragic loss of life. The annual remembrance ceremony at the cemetery in Queens is now headed by the owners of the cemetery, two former New York police officers, along with a few dedicated historians. While the ceremony honors the victims of the tragic accident, much of the emphasis is placed on the heroic acts of bystanders and witnesses on the day of the event in trying to save the victims. Uh, this is combined with an annual presentation of the General Slocum Hero and Community Service Award, which was established by survivors and families of the General Slocum victims to honor community members who have gone above and beyond in, to serve their community. The owners of the cemetery use this occasion to honor all present-day police, firefighters, and military for their service. The emphasis has moved away from the everyday German immigrant victims onto the other members of the population of the day and the present-day people and affiliated with the victims. 
While it is wonderful that this ceremony has continued even after the last survivor died in 2004, and although honoring bravery is an important goal, commemorating the lives lost on the ship has to be the main goal of any remembrance ceremony. Much has been done in the past uh, 10 to 20 years to rectify the lack of memorialization to the victims of this tragic accident. But in order to truly memorialize the victims, we have to understand why they have not been given the remembrance that we would expect from such a huge disaster right in the heart of New York City, and to work to change that. Thank you. Effects of the nationwide economic depression of the 1930s were especially severe for immigrants who had come to the United States during the last great wave of immigration from about 1880 to the mid-1920s. Americans everywhere felt the terrible effects of the Great Depression, but in the cities, millions of people living in close quarters were thrown out of work and into even deeper poverty than they had known before the economy's collapse. In New York City, the Great Depression particularly affected recent immigrants. In the 1930s, shanty towns formed coast to coast in cities of the United States. These shanty towns were often called Hoovervilles, named after President Herbert Hoover, who was president during the beginning of the Great Depression and was widely blamed for it. These settlements were often formed on empty land and generally consisted of tents and small shacks. Authorities did not officially recognize these Hoovervilles and occasionally removed the occupants for trespassing on private lands, but they were frequently tolerated or ignored out of necessity. The book, The Park and the People, A History of Central Park, says there were 1.2 million Americans homeless in the winter of 1932 to 33. 2,000 of those were New Yorkers who managed as best they could on the street. New York City was home to several <coughs> large Hoovervilles during the 1930s. Some of the most notable ones were Hoover Valley on what is now the Great Lawn of Central Park, Packing Box City on Houston Street, Camp Thomas Paine on Riverside Park at 72nd Street and the Hudson River, and a shanty town in Red Hook, Brooklyn off Columbia Street. Although it is often left out of the popular history, the largest Hooverville in New York was actually in the East Village on the East River between 8th and 10th Streets. This Hooverville, called Hard Luck Town, or sometimes Hard Lucksville, or sometimes Hard Luck on the River, is the subject of our presentation today. Hard Luck Town was founded by Bill Smith, who built the first shack there in around May of 1932. <coughs> by August, Hard Luck Town took up at least two blocks on East 9th and 10th Streets at the East River, and it was made up of about 60 shacks, which were laid out along two streets named Jimmy Walker Avenue and Roosevelt Lane, after the New York mayor and the U.S. president. The population of the town was around 450 people. Hard Luck Town, like most other shanty towns in New York, was inhabited only by men and no women or children. A typical shack was made of wood with a door and a window. Various materials such as plaster and corrugated cardboard provided some insulation from the cold. Hard Luck Town was well organized. It had a street cleaning department, a commissary, and various other departments quote, that any real city should have, according to the New York Times. Bill Smith, the first resident of the shanty town, became the unofficial mayor of Hard Luck Town. This is a quote from Bill Smith. Folks come over and give us pots and pans, and I distribute them wherever they're needed. The street cleaning fellows from the city lend us their brooms and shovels, and we keep the place ship shape, as you can see. We have running water at the fire hydrant, and there's a floating bath right off the foot of 10th Street. A city bath, so it's easy to keep clean. And this is a photograph of people keeping clean in Hard Luck Town. Okay, so I'm going to get into a little bit on just what kinds of people lived inside of Hard Luck Town. Uh, and this is a photo of its mayor, Bill Smith. He appeared in a New York Times article from August 3rd, 1932. Fittingly, the one-room shack that we had mentioned he made became the city hall of the town, and by August, Mayor Bill had made two additional rooms. The shack was built out of scraps of metal from the old Sullivan shipyard. The doors were made out of packing cases, and each room was separated by a length of carpet. Because Bill was profiled in the New York Times, we were able to find out a lot more about him than all of the other residents. Um, he was a sailor who had apparently been around the world three times. He was born on August 12, 1877, and was 55 in 1932. His instinct to build up a shantytown by the river was 
uh, directly related to his vast experience with the water as a sailor. Pure sailor instinct is how he put it in the article. A seafaring man can think better looking at the blue water. During his interview, the only garment of clothing Bill was wearing was a tattered pair of blue swim shorts. He told the reporter, don't mind the way I look. I always dress like this when I receive distinguished visitors. <laughs> Mayor Bill had an old dog named Nellie, who, according to him, used to live in a respectable home somewhere on 10th Street, before she decided that she preferred Hard Luck Town. The reporter described Nellie as half police dog and half something else that was hard to classify. Mayor Bill insisted that Hard Luck Town was the cleanest jungle in the city, and argued that naturally Nellie understood this and chose it over her previous residence. As organized as Harlow Town was physically, it was also organized socially. One part of the town was an Irish settlement and the other part was Polish. Importantly, Mayor Bill emphasized there was no red talk, meaning no communist talk, was permitted among the residents. In Hard Luck Town, swearing off red talk can be seen as residual effects from the first Red Scare, which was the fear of Bolshevism and anarchism, fueled by immigrants hailing from Southern and Eastern Europe. That being said, the, the town did function in a somewhat socialist capacity. However, that likely stemmed from the military practice of taking care of your comrades. Men who found temporary work shared the food that they were able to purchase with everyone in the town. According to Mayor Bill, the men would buy stale bread because it's cheaper and pick up a meaty bone here and there for next to nothing to make the soup. Mayor Bill ran the town like a tight ship. The New York Times article described the town as a place of almost military order. The men were woken up every morning with the reveille and got up to watch the flag raise over City Hall. At night, the flag was lowered and folded for the evening. <coughs> Mayor Bill described this routine by saying, the flag goes up with sunset and comes down with daylight. This is a camp of patriots. Residents played pinochle and poker. By candlelight, they swam in the water, and their evenings, they strolled down Jimmy Walker Avenue and Roosevelt Lane. On March 26th in 1933, the New York Times profiled another individual in Hard Luck Town. This one was a Polish American. <coughs> Uh, this man was an expert machinist who had fought in World War I. He even represented his division in the AEF boxing tournaments in France. As a recent immigrant, he could not find substantial work in New York City during the Great Depression. He was offered a few jobs for, quote, starvation wages. One man offered him $3 a month and board to be a chauffeur, a gardener, the dishwasher, furnace man, house painter, rug beater, and the motorboat engineer. This man emphasized that he was happy to work, but he would not be a slave. I will work my head off. I don't mind if my boss makes four times as much out of my labor as he gives me, so long as he is fair. But I will not be a slave. I will still be a free man and get along somehow. This man lived in Hard Luck Town, sharing a small shack with a man who was a cabinet maker and an artist, who also couldn't find any work. Next door to them lived a corporation of five men, all skilled in trade, but also out of work, presumably also immigrants. To make a little money, the boxer machinist gathered caked and stiff paintbrushes from a trash can, and then he cleaned them with the hopes of selling the lot for maybe like 10 to 15 cents. His cabinet maker roommate was making a mandolin out of scraps of wood that he had found on the pier of the East River. The five men next door were in the firewood business. Three men gathered wood for firewood, and then sawed it up, and the other two peddled the product in the neighborhoods. The five men together made about 50 cents a day. Interestingly, there were no women and children in Hard Luck Town. The Red Hook Cooperville was the only one in New York City that housed families. Women and children were often given priorities when it came to homeless shelters. Hoovervilles were densely populated by men who had either left their families in search of work and were unsuccessful, or had just abandoned them entirely because they, were, they feared that they would be too much of a burden on their family. The men of Hard Luck Town got by with very little charity. The only mention of outside help we were able to find was on Thanksgiving Day in 1932, when Urban Ledoux, often called Mr. Zero, came to town to distribute socks, wool hats, underwear, and mittens. Mr. Zero came the next day to serve mulligan stew, which was made out of goose, turkey, and duck. 
Interestingly, Mr. Lejeu was mentioned numerous times in New York Times articles from the 1930s, often under the pseudonym Mr. Zero. In 1925, he opened a restaurant called The Tub near the Bowery that fed and housed homeless shelter. Or fed and, yeah, fed and housed the homeless, sorry. <laughs> the Tub became famous for its big crop of mulligan stew, allegedly made out of a thousand turkeys. He was a true social activist and champion for the rights of the poor. Mm. So I'll talk about um, the artistic representation of the hard left town and the Great Depression at large. The shantytowns in New York City were emblematic of the social unrest and political anxieties the country was experiencing in the wake of the Great Depression. Images of the poor and downtrodden forced out of their homes and onto the streets surfaced in the newspapers and in artistic documentation as the nation's strife continued. Here is the artist, the artist captures in his lithograph print the despondent feelings immigrants such as himself were experienced during the time. This is a com the common style depicting the hardwood town of East Village and the other who reveals known as social realism. The style originated in the mid-19th century during the British Industrial Revolution and has been appropriated by various nations undergoing radical social change, usually motivated by leftist concerns and democratic sentiments. The Hardlick Town has been represented in paintings, photographs, and drawings of the social realist genre rendered by various artists of different notoriety. Here are Robert Cummings Weissman works in simple gesture drawings depicting a dilapidated shaft in the hard left town and a rundown car left on 9th Street. The car drawing brings to life a quote from a newspaper article in the hard left town where a resident relates, the overturned body of a scrap Model T Ford car will shed a cloud burst and has room under it for a man to sleep. The statement transforms the automobile from an abandoned pile of scrap <coughs> to sleeping quarters for the 9th Street resident. Wiseman's style depicts the rundown of social conditions the people of the hard left town suffered, emblematic of the social realist style and taking on a gesture aesthetic reminiscent of the many newspaper illustrations circulating at the time. Vigil Marsh, a celebrated artist of the movement, is most known for the iconic red line etching, No One Has Starved. As seen in this image, Marsh is characterized by his compact compositions and uncompromising realities. Arts Magazine notes, while some criticized Marsh for making overtly political statements in his work, <coughs> most applauded him for telling hard truths about the reality of contemporary life. Marsh was infatuated with the composition formed around East 10th Street that he reproduced multiple times and later titled Jungle, and East 10th Jungle or East 10th Street Jungle. He has three known variations of the scene shown here. In the midst of a crumbling brick building, dozens of men crowd together, some sleeping in the dirt, one on top of another, other dressing themselves for the day in the rubble or, heated, or heating their meals over a trash can fire. To the left you can see a man shaving his face, looking into a mirror, hung up the decaying wall. Marsh made several paintings of this image as well as the next etching. Although there are some great works documenting the Hardwick town, the amount of social photographs and artworks made are nothing in comparison to the documentation of the country after the election of Franklin D. Roosevelt, who came into office within months of the Hardwick town closing. The Hardwick town and, New York, and the New York City social realists at the time didn't have the same support from the government of Herbert Hoover, but their images captured a fragment of the East Village shanty town and shaped the beginning of American social realism. Hard Luck Town was cleared by the city in 1933. They only gave the residents 10 days notice. One resident named Old John Cahill reacted to the clearance by telling a reporter, nobody's asking us where we're going. There's not a soul thinking about us. This 1934 map from the New York Times shows the areas being considered for slum clearance. The black portion indicates first choice areas and includes the East Village waterfront. The poor immigrant housing in the East Village and the <coughs> former location of Hard Luck Town would eventually be raised as per Robert Moses' vision. Interestingly, the site of Hard Luck Town is now home to the Jacob Rees Houses, a public housing project built in 1949. And that's the end of our presentation. Thank you.
Effects of the nationwide economic depression of the 1930s were especially severe for immigrants who had come to the United States during the last great wave of immigration from about 1880 to the mid-1920s. Americans everywhere felt the terrible effects of the Great Depression, but in the cities, millions of people living in close quarters were thrown out of work and into even deeper poverty than they had known before the economy's collapse. In New York City, the Great Depression particularly affected recent immigrants. In the 1930s, shanty towns formed coast to coast in cities of the United States. These shanty towns were often called Hoovervilles, named after President Herbert Hoover, who was president during the beginning of the Great Depression and was widely blamed for it. These settlements were often formed on empty land and generally consisted of tents and small shacks. Authorities did not officially recognize these Hoovervilles and occasionally removed the occupants for trespassing on private lands they were frequently tolerated or ignored out of necessity. The book, The Park and the People, A History of Central Park, says there were 1.2 million Americans homeless in the winter of 1932 to 33. 2,000 of those were New Yorkers who managed as best they could on the street. New York City was home to several large Hoovervilles during the 1930s. Some of the most notable ones were Hoover Valley on what is now the Great Lawn of Central Park, Packing Box City on Houston Street, Camp Thomas Payne on Riverside Park at 72nd Street and the Hudson River, and a shanty town in Red Hook, Brooklyn off Columbia Street. Although it is often left out of the popular history, the largest Hooverville in New York was actually in the East Village on the East River between 8th and 10th Street. This Hooverville, called Hard Luck Town, or sometimes Hard Luxville, or sometimes Hard Luck on the River, is the subject of our presentation today. Hard Luck Town was founded by Bill Smith, who built the first shack there in around May of 1932. <coughs> by August, Hard Luck Town took up at least two blocks on East 9th and 10th Streets at the East River, and it was made up of about 60 shacks, which were laid out along two streets named Jimmy Walker Avenue and Roosevelt Lane, after the New York mayor and the US president. The population of the town was around 450 people. Hard Luck Town, like most other shanty towns in New York, was inhabited only by men and no women or children. A typical shack was made of wood with a door and a window. Various materials such as plaster and corrugated cardboard provided some insulation from the cold. Hard Luck Town was well organized. It had a street cleaning department, a commissary, and various other departments quote, that any real city should have, according to the New York Times. Bill Smith, the first resident of the shanty town, became the unofficial mayor of Hard Luck Town. This is a quote from Bill Smith. Folks come over and give us pots and pans, and I distribute them wherever they're needed. The street cleaning fellows from the city lend us their brooms and shovels, and we keep the place ship shape, as you can see. We have running water at the fire hydrant, and there's a floating bath right off the foot of 10th Street. A city bath, so it's easy to keep clean. And this is a photograph of people keeping clean in Hard Luck Town. Okay, so I'm going to get into a little bit on just what kinds of people lived inside of Hard Luck Town. Uh, and this is a photo of its mayor, Bill Smith. He appeared in a New York Times article from August 3rd, 1932. Fittingly, the one-room shack that we had mentioned he made became the city hall of the town, and by August, Mayor Bill had made two additional rooms. The shack was built out of scraps of metal from the old Sullivan shipyard. The doors were made out of packing cases, and each room was separated by a length of carpet. Because Bill was profiled in the New York Times, we were able to find out a lot more about him than all of the other residents. Um, he was a sailor who had apparently been around the world three times. He was born on August 12, 1877, and was 55 in 1932. His instinct to build up a shanty town by the river was a, directly related to his vast experience with the water as a sailor. Pure sailor instinct is how he put it in the article. A seafaring man can think better looking at the blue water. During his interview, the only garment of clothing Bill was wearing was a tattered pair of blue swim shorts. He told the reporter, don't mind the way I look. I always dress like this when I receive distinguished visitors. <laughs> Mayor Bill had an old dog named Nellie, who, according to him, used to live in a respectable home somewhere on 10th Street, before she decided that she preferred Hard Town. 
The reporter described Nellie as half police dog and half something else that was hard to classify. <coughs> Mayor Bill insisted that Hard Luck Town was the cleanest jungle in the city and argued that naturally Nellie understood this and chose it over her previous residence. As organized as Hard Luck Town was physically, it was also organized socially. One part of the town was an Irish settlement, and the other part was Polish. Importantly, Mayor Bill emphasized there was no red talk, meaning no communist talk, was permitted among the residents. In Hard Luck Town, swearing off red talk can be seen as residual effects from the first Red Scare, which was the fear of Bolshevism and anarchism, fueled by immigrants hailing from Southern and Eastern Europe. That being said, the, the town did function in a somewhat socialist capacity. However, that likely stemmed from the military practice of taking care of your comrades. Men who found temporary work shared the food that they were able to purchase with everyone in the town. According to Mayor Bill, the men would buy stale bread because it's cheaper and pick up a meaty bone here and there for next to nothing to make the soup. Mayor Bill ran the town like a tight ship. The New York Times article described the town as a place of almost military order. The men were woken up every morning with the reveille and got up to watch the flag raise over City Hall. At night, the flag was lowered and folded for the evening. <coughs> Maribel described this routine by saying, the flag goes up with sunset and comes down with daylight. This is a camp of patriots. Residents played pinochle and poker. By candlelight, they swam in the water, and their evenings, they strolled down Jimmy Walker Avenue and Roosevelt Lane. On March 26th in 1933, the New York Times profiled another individual in Hard Luck Town. This one was a Polish American. Uh, this man was an expert machinist who had fought in World War I. He even represented his division in the AEF boxing tournaments in France. As a recent immigrant, he could not find substantial work in New York City during the Great Depression. He was offered a few jobs for, quote, starvation wages. One man offered him $3 a month and board, to be a chauffeur, a gardener, the dishwasher, furnace man, house painter, rug beater, and the motorboat engineer. This man emphasized that he was happy to work, but he would not be a slave. I will work my head off. I don't mind if my boss makes four times as much out of my labor as he gives me, so long as he is fair. But I will not be a slave. I will still be a free man and get along somehow. This man lived in Hard Luck Town, sharing a small shack with a man who was a cabinet maker and an artist, who also couldn't find any work. Next door to them lived a corporation of five men, all skilled in trade, but also out of work, presumably also immigrants. To make a little money, the boxer machinist gathered caked and stiffed paintbrushes from a trash can, and then he cleaned them with the hopes of selling the lot for maybe like 10 to 15 cents. His cabinet maker roommate was making a mandolin out of scraps of wood that he had found on the pier of the East River. The five men next door were in the firewood business. Three men gathered wood for firewood and then sawed it up, and the other two peddled the product in the neighborhoods. The five men together made about 50 cents a day. Interestingly, there were no women and children in Hard Luck Town. The Red Hook Cooperville was the only one in New York City that housed families. Women and children were often given priorities when it came to homeless shelters. Hoovervilles were densely populated by men who had either left their families in search of work and were unsuccessful, or had just abandoned them entirely because they, were, they feared that they would be too much of a burden on their family. The men of Hard Luck Town got by with very little charity. The only mention of outside help we were able to find was on Thanksgiving Day in 1932 when Urban Ledoux, often called Mr. Zero, came to town to distribute socks, wool hats, underwear, and mittens. Mr. Zero came the next day to serve mulligan stew, which was made out of goose, turkey, and duck. Interestingly, Mr. Ledoux was mentioned numerous times in New York Times articles from the 1930s, often under the pseudonym Mr. Zero. In 1925, he opened a restaurant called The Tub near the Bowery that fed and housed homeless shelter, or fed and yeah, that didn't house the homeless, sorry. <laughs> the tub became famous for its big crop of mulligan stew, allegedly made out of a thousand turkeys. He was a true social activist and champion for the rights of the poor. Mm -hmm.
about um, the artistic representation of the Hardwick Town and the Great Depression at large. The shantytowns of New York City were emblematic of the social unrest and political anxieties the country was experiencing in the wake of the Great Depression. Images of the poor and downtrodden forced out of their homes and onto the streets surfaced in the newspapers and in artistic documentation as the nation's strike continued. Here is the artist, the artist captures in his lithograph print the despondent feelings immigrants such as himself were experienced during the time. This is a com the common style depicting the hardwood town of East Village and the other Hoover Bills known as social realism. The style originated in the mid-19th century during the British Industrial Revolution and has been appropriated by various nations undergoing radical social change, usually motivated by leftist concerns and democratic sentiments. The Hardwick Town has been represented in paintings, photographs, and drawings of the social realist genre rendered by various artists of different notoriety. Here, Robert Cummings Weissman works in simple gesture drawings depicting a dilapidated shaft in the Hardwick Town and a rundown car left on 9th Street. The card drawing brings to life a quote from a newspaper article in the Hardluck Town, where a resident relates, the overturned body of a scrap model T Ford car will shed a cloudburst and has room under it for a man to sleep. The statement transforms the automobile from an abandoned pile of scrap to sleeping quarters for the night week resident. Wiseman's style depicts the rundown social conditions the people of the Hardluck Town suffered, emblematic of the social realist style and taking on a gesture aesthetic reminiscent of the many newspaper illustrations circulating at the time. Edgel Marsh, a celebrated artist of the movement, is most known for the iconic breadline etching, No One Has Starved. As seen in this image, Marsh is characterized by his compact compositions and uncompromising realities. Arts Magazine notes, while some criticized Marsh for making overtly political statements in his work, <coughs> most applauded him for telling hard truths about the reality of contemporary life. Marsh was infatuated with the composition formed around East 10th Street that he reproduced multiple times and later titled Jungle, on East 10th, Jungle or East 10th Street Jungle. He has three known variations of the scene shown here. In the midst of a crumbling brick building, dozens of men crowd together, some sleeping in the dirt, one on top of another, other dressing themselves for the day in the rubble or, heated, or heating their meals over a trash can fire. To the left you can see a man shaving his face, looking into a mirror, hung up the decaying wall. Marsh made several paintings of this image as well as the next etching. Although there are some great works documenting the Hardwick town, the amount of social photographs and artworks made are nothing in comparison to the documentation of the country after the election of Franklin D. Roosevelt, who came into office within months of the Hardwick town closing. The Hardwick town and, New York, and the New York City social realists at the time didn't have the same support from the government of Herbert Hoover, but their images captured a fragment of the East Village Shanty Town and shaped the beginning of American social realism. was cleared by the city in 1933. They only gave the residents 10 days notice. One resident named Old John Cahill reacted to the clearance by telling a reporter, nobody's asking us where we're going. There's not a soul thinking about us. This 1934 map from the New York Times shows the areas being considered for slum clearance. The black portion indicates first choice areas and includes the East Village waterfront. The poor immigrant housing in the East Village and the former location of Hard Luck Town would eventually be raised as per Robert Moses' vision. Interestingly, the site of Hard Luck Town is now home to the Jacob Rees Houses, a public housing project built in 1949. And that's the end of our presentation. Thank you.